today and hopefully very much of uh, the following class. Okay, today the, I will start on the uh, talk about uh, the subject on the degradation of a concrete uh, due to sulfate activity. So one of the things actually uh, many of you have uh, uh, learned in the undergraduate study is that when the concrete is exposed in environments where the groundwater or soil contain high sulfate content, the concrete can be damaged due to the sulfate attack. So typically we call this traditional or classical sulfate attack. So I will go through this uh, part first and then talk about uh, some of the other sulfate attack, which is recognized in recent years. So sulfate attack of the concrete uh, is one of the most widespread and a common form of a chemical attack to concrete. So when we talk about the sulfate, one thing, of course, as I mentioned, in natural environments, in groundwater or in soil, the other thing is actually industrial sources. So some places in mine tailing, where they pile mine tailing. So in this kind of a situation, the groundwater can also have high sulfate content. So when the concrete is exposed to high sulfate environment of groundwater or soil, with the time, the concrete can be deteriorated. So here is one example. You can see that with the time, so large part of the concrete exposed to the high sulfate, the concrete is gone, basically. So what you see left here is some of the steel bars. And in this case, you can see that the surface, the cement paste is gone. And whatever you see left, it's the aggregate is exposed. So this is some of the uh, classical uh, sulfate attack. So in terms of the mechanism, how the concrete is affected by the sulfate in groundwater and in soil. So basically when we talk about the mechanism of sulfate attack, so basically are three steps. So first step is dissolved sulfate penetrate into the concrete. So we learned in previous class, concrete is porous material. Depending on the water to cement ratio and the degree of cement hydration, so in the concrete, you have capillary porosity of different sizes in the concrete. So the dissolved sulfate penetrate into the concrete. The first reaction involved is that the sulfate react with the calcium hydroxides. So it forms gypsum, and you have hydroxide of a salt. So depending on what type of the sulfate is involved, so for example, if it's sodium sulfate, and then this part will be sodium hydroxide. So this is the first step. So the formation of the gypsum in this reaction, it's accompanied by an expansion in volume. Okay, so the formation of gypsum, it's accompanied by an expansion in volume by roughly about 120%. Okay. So this is the second step. The third step, in terms of the mechanism of a, a sulfate attack is that this gypsum, it's reacted with a monosulfur aluminate. This is another hydrogen product from cement hydrogen. So with the availability of a water, so the product is ethringite. So the formation of ethringite is also accompanied by volume increase. So this increase is roughly about 55%. So in addition to this, uh, uh, the penetration of uh, sulfate and the formation of gypsum and ettringite, the other thing is that if the ettringite from this step number three, if it's in microcrystalline form, and this microcrystalline form of ettringite can absorb water, with the absorption water, it further increases the expansion. So with the formation of gypsum and ettringite, and absorption of water by microcrystalline of ettringite, it leads to increase of a volume. And as a result, it generates internal stress in the concrete. When the stress exceeds the strength of a concrete, you will have a cracking, right? And then eventually you have a deterioration of the concrete. So this is actually a graph 
of underground piles subject to a sulfate attack. So basically, when the concrete is exposed to environment where you have a high sulfate content, the consequence of a sulfate attack, you have expansion, okay? the formation of gypsum, ephrondite, and absorption of a microcrystalline of, uh, of uh, ephrondite. So you have expansion and the cracking. And as a result, you also have the loss of strength due to the loss of a cohesion in the cement paste, and it's bound to be aggregate. And usually the damage is started from the edge, okay, at the surface, and then eventually goes in. Then you see these pictures here. So you have all the concrete exposed to the high sulfate environment. Concrete is gone. So one of the things actually has been found in the research it published a few years is that the deterioration of the concrete due to sulfate attack is actually affected by the size of the structural elements. So the publication this here is laboratory research. So basically you have C here, X here is the days of exposure to a high sulfate environments. Y here is the expansion. So these three lines here is actually specimens of different sizes. So you can see that when you have a small specimen, thin specimen, you can see that even have a one year or less than one year, you have a significant expansion, it's noticed. But with the increase of a size of a specimen, so when you have a 39, 39 by 160 millimeter, this is a common prism we used in the lab for testing. So you can see that up to about 300 days, you have very limited expansion. So the expansion is actually related to the size of the uh, uh, specimens. So the other thing is actually we talk about all these consequences. And in the field, oftentimes, sulfate attack is not always accompanied by the expansion. So sometimes you have uh, this uh, uh, conversion of the hydrogen product or binding component of the cement paste into <coughs> non-binding components. So as a result, the concrete, the cement paste, the losing binding capacity. So therefore, concrete deteriorates, but it may not always be accompanied by expen uh, expansion. So one of the reasons it's related to the size of the uh, specimens. The other thing has been shown in research is that the sulfate attack on concrete is actually depending on what type of sulfate. So commonly encountered in real life in terms of the sulfate, you have sodium, potassium sulfate, calcium sulfate, and magnesium sulfates. So if we compare these different types of the sulfate, magnesium sulfate has more significant effects on the concrete in terms of their attack on the concrete compared with the other type of the uh, uh, sulfate. Uh, the reason is that magnesium sulfate, they not only affect the calcium hydroxide, as I mentioned in this uh, first part. The magnesium, magnesium sulfate can affect calcium silicate hydrates and also monosulfur aluminates. Okay, so let's take a look at the chemical reaction if we are dealing with magnesium sulfate. So magnesium sulfate can react with calcium silicate hydrate. Okay, so this is the main component which binds cement paste and aggregate together, right? So the main thing contributes to the strength. So the reaction of these two will form gypsum and magnesium hydroxide and the silica hydroxide. So this is basically silicon dioxide with X number of water molecules. So in the process of formation of magnesium hydroxide and silicon hydroxide, these two can further react to form crystalline magnesium silicate. So this crystalline magnesium silicate has no binding component, no binding capacity. 
So effect, in effect, it is that in this chemical reaction, <coughs> so the magnesium sulfate turns calcium silicate hydrates, which is the main binding component of the concrete, into crystalline magnesium silicate, which have no binding capacity, no binding properties. So as a result, this has a significant influence to the concrete durability, so affect the concrete. So in addition to this, the magnesium sulfate can also attack a monosulfur aluminate. So the reaction of a magnesium sulfate and monosulfur aluminate, it will also form gypsum and magnesium hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide. Okay, so this is the effect on the monosulfur aluminates. And the similar to other type of the sulfate, like a sodium or potassium sulfate, the magnesium sulfate also affects the calcium hydroxide from concrete. So the reaction product is gypsum and magnesium hydroxide. Okay, one thing you notice that in these three reactions here, so all forms one component, magnesium hydroxide. So the magnesium hydroxide can form, so magnesium actually oftentimes form in, uh, form in voids, capri voids. So initial formation of a magnesium hydroxide in core will reduce the porosity, will reduce the penetration of sulfate into the concrete. However, with the time, due to the effect of a magnesium sulfate on calcium silicate hydrates, uh, monosulfur aluminate and the calcium hydroxide, eventually concrete will be destroyed. So in addition, when we talk about magnesium sulfate attack on the concrete, it is very much affected by the concentration of magnesium <coughs> sulfate. So in addition all, to all these uh, three chemical reactions, uh, the reaction itself also reduce the pH level of the core solution in the concrete. So if the concrete, so one of the things we will talk about in later class is the concrete protection to steel reinforcements. Uh, one of the reasons that concrete are able to protect the steel reinforcement embedded in reinforced concrete structure is due to the high pH level of the core solution. So if you have reduced the pH level, that will affect the stability of steel reinforcements. So this is the actually type of the sulfate have a different extent of damage to the concrete. So magnesium sulfate has more significant damage to the concrete compared with the other three types of sulfates. So next I want to briefly mention about the seawater. So this table here give you a typical composition of seawater. So basically in seawater you have sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, and magnesium sulfate, and calcium sulfate, and calcium chloride. So one of the main things when we cast the concrete exposed, mar uh, exposed to marine environment is the penetration of chloride. Right. So that will affect, affect the stability of steel reinforcements. Okay, so this one we will talk about uh, later on. Because of the in seawater, you also have a calcium sulfate and a magnesium sulfate. So the sulfate attack of a concrete, it's also a cancellation. So when the concrete is exposed to seawater, okay, so the magnesium sulfate in seawater can react with the calcium hydroxide. It forms the magnesium hydroxide and calcium sulfate. So as I mentioned, that this magnesium hydroxide can fill the voids initially. So the reduction of a voids due to the formation of magnesium hydroxide in the core can reduce the penetration of harmful substance in seawater, penetrate into the concrete. So therefore, when we cancel the concrete, if you have the same type of a concrete, if they are exposed to the concentration of magnesium sulfate in the same concentration, one is in, let's say, in industrialized water, and the other one is seawater. The concrete exposed to seawater will have less effects 
So mainly it's due to, one thing is due to the formation of this uh, magnesium hydroxide, which fill the voids, reduce the penetration of a harmful substance into the concrete. The other thing is actually related to the um, solubility of ephrondite and gypsum in the environment where you have a chloride. So in seawater, you have abundance of chloride ions. So in this kind of environment, the gypsum and ephrondite are more soluble. So as a result, it will have a less expansion and will cause less damage compared in the situation where the concrete is exposed to groundwater. So this is because of a more soluble of the gypsum and ephrondite in the environment with the chloride, it reduces the deleterious expansion. Okay. So therefore, if we consider the same concentration, the concrete exposed to the seawater will have a less damage compared to the uh, uh, concrete exposed to groundwater where you have the same concentration of sulfate. One thing I want to mention is that when the concrete is exposed to marine environments, one of the main concerns is actually the penetration of chloride into the reinforced concrete structures. So this is the main concern, the penetration of chloride cause corrosion of steel reinforcements. So in previous class, when I talk about a concrete and mixed design, depending on the exposure condition, so in more severe exposure condition, we reduce the water to cement ratio, right? So therefore, in most of the situation when the concrete exposed to marine environments, sulfate attack is made not a, not a main consideration. The main consideration of a concrete exposed to marine environment is corrosion of steel reinforcement due to the penetration of a chloride from seawater. So I will talk about this corrosion a little bit later. Well, we know that uh, the mechanism of we know the mechanism of the sulfate attack to the concrete is due to the penetration of sulfate and react with calcium hydroxide and to form the uh, gypsum and eventually react with the monosulfate aluminate forming ephrondite. So, how do we actually control the sulfate attack in the situation when you have a groundwater or soil containing high sulfates? So the first step in terms of <coughs> the first step of a sulfate attack is the penetration of sulfate uh, from the environment into the concrete. So if we can make dense concrete, we can reduce the penetration of sulfate into the concrete. So how do we actually make dense concrete? So by now you have already learned quite a lot. So one of the most important thing is that you can reduce the water to cement ratio, right? So in addition to that, you can use uh, mineral admixtures uh, such as ground granulated, blaster furnace slag, and class F fly ash, or silica fuel, or collective cement, right? So all these allow you to make a dense concrete. So the penetration of sulfate from environment into the concrete will be reduced. The other thing is actually the second step is actually when the sulfate penetrates into the concrete, it will react with the calcium hydroxide to form gypsum, right? So if we can reduce the calcium hydroxide in the concrete, you basically can reduce step number two attack, right? So if we use the mineral admixtures in concrete, due to the protonic reactions, and you will have reduced the calcium hydroxide in concrete, right? Protonic reaction basically reduces the calcium hydroxide content, but increase calcium silicate hydrates in concrete. So that way, using the mineral mixture, you can reduce the calcium hydroxide content. So from this, uh, uh, these two, you can see here, using mineral admixture actually, actually is very beneficial in terms of the uh, improved concrete resistance to sulfate attack. The third step, when we talk about uh, the mechanism, is that the gypsum reactor with the monosulfate aluminates 
and enter the presence more water to form gypsum. So basically, it depends um, how much monosulfur illuminates inside of the concrete, right? So in order to reduce the monosulfur illuminate inside of the concrete, the third step in terms of the control the sulfate attack is to minimize the C3A content in cement. So in early class, I talked about Portland cement. You have a sulfate resistant cement, ASTM type of white cement. And then if you have a, a concrete exposed to moderate sulfate environment, we also have a type two cement, right? Moderate sulfate resistant cement. So basically, depending on the concentration of the sulfate in groundwater or in soil, you can use sulfate resistant cement, type 5 or type 2, depending on the concentration. So the question is that, okay, so all these three steps, these approaches can be used to improve the concrete resistance to sulfate attack. Which one are more efficient? So let's take a look at this graph here. So this graph here, X is the C3A content in cement. Y here is the relative of deterioration of a concrete due to sulfate attack. Okay, so these three lines are concrete made with different water to cement ratio. So first let's take a look at this line here. So this is water cement ratio, it's 0 0.74, it's very high. So in this, uh, this, from this line, from the results you can see here, so if we reduce the C3A content in the cement, the relative rate of deterioration of concrete due to sulfate is substantially reduced compared to when you use cement type 1 or type 3 cement. Okay? So at a high water to cement ratio, reduce the C3A content in cement or reduce the sulfate attack to concrete. Next, let's take a look at this line here. Okay, so this is a concrete with a water to cement ratio of 0 0.42. So from this one, you can see that although reduce the C3A content, the deterioration of a concrete will be reduced, the rate of deterioration. But the difference is not significant. The other thing I want you to compare is that in this case, when you use type 5 cement, Okay, sorry, type of 2 cement, type of 5 cement here. So when you have a higher water to cement ratio, even when you have a low C3A content in the cement, the rate of deterioration of a concrete due to sulfate attack, it's greater than the concrete with a low water cement ratio, but a higher C3A content. So from this graph, you can see that water to cement, low water to cement ratio, it's more beneficial, more useful to improve the concrete resistance against the sulfate attack. So let's take a look at these two uh, uh, graphs here. So give you some information on the water to cement ratio. So this one here, uh, you have a water to cement ratio 0 0.65, and the concrete made with a type of 5 cement, so after 12 years, you can see that all the surface mortar is gone. So you have a coarse aggregate or exposed, right? So severe deterioration due to sulfate attack. So the same one here, so it's made of also with a type of 5 cement. However, this one, the water to cement ratio is 0 0.39. So this is after 16 years. So you can see that the damage is much less compared with this case, where concrete have a high water to cement ratio. So from this one, you can see that the water to cement ratio is very important to parameter. So that's why when we design the concrete mixtures, so we talked about it earlier, the more severe the exposure conditions, the lower the water cement ratio we need to have. So this one we talked about in previous class. Right. <coughs> depending on the sulfate concentration in groundwater and the sulfate content in soil, so you can have XA1, XA2, X3. So depending on the severity, so you have maximum allowable water to cement ratio, strength class, and cement content. Right. 
So the more severe exposure condition, so you need to have a lower water to cement ratio, higher strength class. So this is the first one I want to talk about, uh, is uh, 